Good morning and welcome to our live stream worship service from Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Menominee Falls in Germantown, Wisconsin. Certainly a privilege to have you worshiping with us today, whether you're watching live or watching the recorded version on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, really is a privilege and a pleasure to have you joining us for worship today. Of course, for most of the people in our world, Easter is long forgotten. It was a, a special day last week, but uh, really didn't change anything in their lives. Everything is back to normal now. But for Christians, we continue to celebrate the truths of Easter for six weeks after Easter, uh, because it really is the center of our faith. This truth that Jesus has risen from the dead as tangible evidence of our forgiveness. And the theme of today's service is that Jesus really does give us evidence as the basis of our faith, that we need not doubt his love and care, our forgiveness and salvation, because we have evidence for his resurrection. We'll follow the order of service that's printed or that will be uh, displayed on our, on our uh, TV for this service. And that begins with the singing of our opening hymn, morning breaks upon the tomb. May God richly bless your worship today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
In the peace of this forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Scripture lesson for this second Sunday of Easter, according to 1 Peter chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though for now, a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the genuine, the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end results of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. We continue by confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with our hymn of the day, O Sons and Daughters of the King. Gospel of the Lord, which is appointed for the second Sunday of Easter, 
comes from John's Gospel, chapter 20. Our sermon will cover the last few verses of this lesson. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen and ascended Lord, my dear brothers and sisters who walk by faith, and not by sight. Blind faith is a term that people use to describe a situation when a person puts their trust and confidence in someone or something even though there isn't evidence that leads them to do that trust. Or even worse, Blind faith can be used to describe a situation where a person puts their trust and confidence into a person or, or thing when all the evidence testifies that they shouldn't put their faith into it. When the people of our world talk about blind faith, they are talking about something very negative, the kind of fanatical uh, following of a person or a movement even though there is no tangible evidence to support that belief. It's kind of the idea of minimizing all the bad and inventing reasons to believe the good. And when, when people of this world look at Christians, what they see is blind faith. They see people who are committed to believing the script, what the scriptures say about Jesus and the salvation that he has earned for us, even though we've never met Jesus. They see our a devotion to the word of God, the unfailing truths of, of the scriptures. And they say that's, that's the kind of blind faith, the, the kind of, uh, of confidence or trust, even though you don't have proof that this scripture, that, these, that this book is different than any other. And when people of this world see our confidence that death is not the end of our existence, but merely the gateway to everlasting life, they see blind faith, people who are minimizing the truths of the evil and are inventing reasons to believe the good. When people look at Christians, they see blind faith. And you know, if it were only unbelievers who saw Christian faith as being blind faith, then 
it's something that I could live with because after all, unbelievers are never going to understand what Christianity and what being a Christian is all about. They can think all kinds of wrong things about us and it doesn't hurt us in any way. The problem though, is that sometimes those same kind of doubts arise in our own hearts and our own minds. We begin to wonder, do we have blind faith? Does Jesus demand blind faith? Why is it that we don't have any tangible evidence as proof of our forgiveness? Does Jesus demand this kind of fanatical faith that believes, even though there is no evidence, or worse, to believe even in the face of negative evidence? Is this the kind of faith that Jesus demands? Does Jesus demand blind faith? Those are the kinds of doubts that sometimes arise in our hearts and in our minds. And this morning, we want to take a few moments to think about that question, about the question, does Jesus demand blind faith? Because at first glance, it certainly seems that he does. Remember what he said to his doubting apostle Thomas? He says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus is talking about believing even though we have not seen. We don't have the advantages that Thomas had. We don't get to, to see and to touch and to put our hand into his side. And yet Jesus wants us to believe just like Thomas did. Is it possible? Is it just possible that Jesus demands blind faith? And it certainly is that case to our sinful natures. It certainly is, it certainly appears to be that Jesus demands blind faith from us. And our sinful natures are going to react against that. There are all kinds of, of doubts that are going to arise in our minds. We're going to say, really, Jesus? You really want me to put my faith, my hope for eternal salvation in the hands of a man that I have never met, a man who lived thousands of years ago in a land thousands of years of thousands of miles away. Our sinful nature is going to say, really, Jesus, you want me to believe that despite all the hardships and difficulties and pain and sorrow that I see around my life, you really want me to believe that God loves me and that he's causing all things to work together for my good? Our sinful nature is going to say, really, Jesus, Really, you want me to believe when I'm sitting at a funeral of a loved one or a friend whose lifeless body lies in a casket? You really want me to believe that death is not the end, but merely the gateway to everlasting life? Really, Jesus, you want me to believe when all the evidence that I see around me testifies to reasons why I shouldn't? Really, Jesus, that's the kind of faith you want me to have? Do you demand blind faith? And here's the danger, dear friends. The danger is that if we let those doubts go unchecked, if we have nothing to say to them, then when hardship and difficulty and danger and disaster come upon us, we will be tempted to walk away from our faith. Those doubts can take over. And they can lead us to, to wonder whether being a Christian is really worth the cost. Whether, whether enduring the scorn and the shame of this sinful world is really worth the trouble. We'll begin to wonder whether or not the Christian faith is just another philosophy of life that's meant to try to help us get through the meaningless of our, meaninglessness of our world, a kind of opiate of the masses a lie that we tell ourselves so that we can get through the day. If we let the doubts in our hearts go unchecked, those doubts can overwhelm and destroy our faith. And so this morning, 
as we continue celebrating the gospel, the Easter gospel of our Jesus Christ, the fact that he is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia. We do well to take a moment to remember what kind of savior we have. We do not have a savior who demands from us blind faith. We have a savior who gives us evidence for the faith that he demands from us. There's no greater example of that than in the, the life of Thomas. Remember that on that first Easter evening when Jesus first appeared to his disciples and he, he showed them his hands and his side, when he said, peace be with you, when he breathed on them and gave them the gift of the Spirit. Remember that Thomas had not been there. We don't know where he was, but he wasn't in the upper room. He wasn't behind locked doors. And so when he heard his fellow disciples say that they had seen the Lord, he doubted. In fact, these are his words. He says, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And so what does our living and, ri and risen Savior do? He appears a week later for the benefit of his doubting apostle. And he takes time and care and concern. He puts extra effort into turning to that doubting disciple and destroying his doubts. He says, go ahead, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And when Thomas sees all this evidence, when he sees the evidence of the, the nail marks in his hands and feet, when he puts his hand into the slot in Jesus' side, when he stops doubting and believes, he has this beautiful confession of faith, my Lord and my God. Finally, Thomas has evidence. Thomas believes because Thomas sees. This whole event with Thomas says more about Jesus than anything else, that Jesus is a Savior who provides evidence for faith. And you and I might ask, well, then where does that leave us? Because in his divine love and wisdom and mercy, our Savior hasn't come to us behind locked doors. And he hasn't held out his hands and invited us to touch the place where the nails were. He hasn't lifted up his tunic and invited us to put our hands into his side. We have not seen, and yet Jesus asks that we believe. If we have a Savior who gives evidence for our faith, and he has not given us visual evidence for our faith, then why isn't his demand of faith blind? And dear brothers and sisters, the reason is because we have another kind of evidence, an evidence that the Apostle Peter says is even greater than what Thomas had. You and I do not have blind faith. Our faith is built upon the word of God. And that too is emphasized in today's gospel. John the evangelist says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These are written that you may believe. John intended those words to refer to his gospel, but they can refer to the entire Bible. The reason that we have the written word of God is so that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the living son of God, that he was raised again from the dead. I know that we have never seen the Lord Jesus with our physical eyes. I know that we've never touched him with our hands. But we have evidence for our faith, and the evidence is in Scripture. 
And that's so important for us to know and to understand and to appreciate because doubts are going to arise in our minds. And when they come, we need to know how to answer them. We need to know how to respond to our doubts so that they cannot take over our faith, so that they, they cannot overwhelm us and lead us away from Jesus. So what is it that God wants you and me to do when out attacks our faith? He wants us to turn into the evidence of faith to the Word of God. When that verse inside of us that says, Really, Jesus, you expect to believe well, then the Word of God testifies to us that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, that we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word shows us that Jesus, the perfect life of obedience to all God's commands, He lived for us. Jesus, or the, the Word shows us this Jesus hanging from a cross to win our salvation. And then we turn to the Word of God where we are reminded that Jesus tells Jesus says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that God causes all things to work together for our good. It is the Word of God that destroys the doubt in our mind. There are hardships and difficulties mean that God has stopped loving us. And yes, when we are at a few where a loved one or a friend is lying in a casket, and one day when we are, it seems like death is the end. But when those doubts arise, flee to the word of God, to the one who tested, to the word that testifies, to the one who said, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. To the word that reminds remi- us today that we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. The Word of God, which reminds us that because Jesus lives, we too shall live. Brothers and sisters, does Jesus demand blind faith? The people of our world are going to look at our faith and they're going to answer, of course he does. Of course the Christian faith is blind. And our own sinful natures are going to look at the hardships and difficulties around us. And our sinful natures are going to try to convince us that the Christian faith is blind, that it's based on no evidence whatsoever. There's a little part of us that wants that that wants to demand from God that there's some kind of tangible evidence, the kind of proof that Thomas received to shore up all of our doubts and worries and concerns. But here's the glorious truth of the second Sunday of Easter, that these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that we do have the basis for our faith, the unchanging and living Word of God. We have a a sure foundation that serves for both life now and for eternity. We have a foundation, a rock that can never be moved, that can never be taken away from us. We have something upon which to base our faith, and that something is the immovable Word of God. So when the world... And when, the sin, and when your sinful nature asks you, does Jesus demand blind faith? Remember how to answer those doubts, those worries, those concerns. Absolutely not. My Savior gives me all the evidence I need for my faith in his infallible and inerrant word. Amen. Now the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus, our one and only Savior. Amen. And we continue with the Create in Me.
Let us pray. O Lord God, our strength, our song, and our salvation, you fulfilled your promises by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. You give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In your compassion, you sent Christ, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life to rescue the lost. Drive out all doubt and gloom, that we may delight in your glorious triumph. Lift our eyes heavenward to see him who lives to make intercession for the saints and grant us confidence in the greatness of his power. Keep before us the vision of your redeemed people standing before your throne and singing the song of Easter victory. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive wisdom and power and honor and glory and praise. Make us instruments of your peace as we bring the good news of hope and new life to those around us. Guide us in the use of all that you have entrusted to us, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Live in us that we may live for you. Merciful Lord Jesus, grant healing to the sick and strengthen the faith of the suffering and the dying. Assure them of your abiding presence and comfort them with the hope of eternal life. We especially pray for our dear brother, Fred Banizak, as he continues to recover from serious health challenges. If it is your will, O Lord, we ask that you would fill the medications he is receiving with your power and your healing, that he might return to his normal life and home. But if that is not your will, and it is time for Fred to be called from this veil of tears, we ask that you would give him and his whole family the confidence of faith, that death is merely the gateway to everlasting life, that because you live, he too shall live, and the sure and certain promise of a reunion with all believers in heaven. Gracious Father, you have restored to us the joy of your salvation. With happy hearts we come before you and say, Alleluia, thanks be to God. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we pray these things as we join together to pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And our closing hymn for this morning's service is We Walk by Faith and Not by Sight. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Good morning again to all of you. It's been a pleasure to worship with you today and be reminded um, of that the basis of our faith is God's almighty word. Certainly my encouragement in this week to come is that you dedicate yourself to hearing and believing that word. And to help you do that, we'd just like to remind you about our normal Bible studies, live streaming Bible studies that will resume this coming week. That begins tonight at 7 o'clock as we study John's Gospel. Continues Tuesday morning at 1015 as we study the book of Revelation. Thursday night at 6 p.m. we study the book of Philippians. And then Saturday morning at 8 a.m., we're looking at the book of Hebrews. So all four of those studies, which were, um, which took a break this past week, will resume again as normal this week. And especially because of the, the basis of our, sermon, of our service today, that it is the word of God that is the basis of our faith, we certainly encourage you to join us for one of these four Bible studies, whether you're watching live here on Facebook or watching a recorded version at your convenience. May God richly bless you in this new week of his grace, and we'll see you the same place next week at 9.15.